You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odo. And I'm Dexter Mlam Wingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. Today on Black Power Talks, we're discussing the role of the African intellectual in the world. African students and teachers everywhere are entering into their spring semesters. Spring semesters are often filled with academic conferences and graduations. On campuses, African students are organizing summits where they tackle some of the pressing issues in the world, such as the mass imprisonment of African people, reparations, and the university investments into the colonial settler state of Israel. On the flip side, many African students will increasingly feel the pressure to decide their postgraduate career plans. On January 17, 2022, the African Black Coalition is holding their annual conference The African Black Coalition is an all-African student organization of representatives from a variety of African student groups, such as the Black Student Union, the African Student Alliance, and other campus groups. As a doctoral student at the University of California, I was able to work with this coalition as the leader of the Black Graduate Student Association. This conference is nearing its 20th year. Later this spring, our very own director, Akile Anai, will be a featured speaker at the Black Consciousness Conference at the California State University, Long Beach. Taking his name from the political movement led by Stephen Biko and Occupy Razani in South Africa, the Black Consciousness Conference was another organizing space for African students who formed a crucial front in the global fight against the apartheid regime in South Africa. Apartheid might have fallen in South Africa, but the African struggle against colonialism and neocolonialism has not yet been completed. Summits such as the African Black Coalition's annual convening at the Black Consciousness Conference are part of a long tradition of Black Power student conferences that date back to the African Revolution of the 1960s. The African Revolution had been ideologically successful, and the masses of African people were won to the position of independence. Still, even then, there was a struggle between the African working class and the African middle class. Following the military defeat of the African Revolution of the 1960s, the African working class was driven out of political life. The African liberation movement suffered an assault by the colonial state, as well as ideological imperialist organizations and intellectuals who sought to redirect our movement from its anti-colonial objectives of building African power and independence to anti-racist struggles aimed at reforming the colonial capitalist state and its superstructure, universities included. In the 1960s, African students from historical Black colleges like South Carolina State College to predominantly white colleges like San Francisco State College challenged the colonial and neocolonial elites in the faculty and administration. African students demanded Black community control of education. Yet, in the wake of the George Floyd murder recently, I have personally witnessed faculty and administrators redirecting the uprising of African students towards lukewarm reforms and gains that serve to benefit the handful of Black faculty and administrators. 
In one document, I actually witnessed demands made to give increased power to an African provost who has done nothing ever to advance the struggle of African people. Despite this flagrant measure that I witnessed, this contradiction is not isolated to any single campus or region. This is a colonial capitalist contradiction that is baked into the general workings of colonial society. Secretary General, Louise Kinshasa addresses the contradictions of higher education in his fundamental essay, The Role of African Intellectuals in the World. In this critical essay, Louise notes that, quote, in any given society, intellectuals are the results of the level of development of the society. Intellectuals are specialized in solving problems that confront society in the process of producing and reproducing real life. Intellectual activities arise in the process of producing life, in the process of solving problems that oppose the development of forces of production. Colonial capitalist production has produced nations, institutions, and social relations needed to reproduce the system. In colonial society, schools, universities, and colleges are used to create the intellectuals to solve the problems of colonial society. Just like Africa's material resources, the African intellectual genius has been mined by colonial powers to advance their society. Loezi demands African students use their skills to solve the problems of the African nation. In the essay, Loezi demands that African students become African working class intellectuals. Loezi writes, African students must first serve the people. Their education must be used to develop the organizational and fighting abilities of the people against neocolonialism. They cannot be apolitical because the universities they are in are not apolitical. There is no such thing as an apolitical institution under slavery. You are either for or against. The commitment of African intellectuals is not to become a mental worker for imperialism. The duty of African intellectuals is to solve the problems of the people, which are imposed on us by a worldwide economic system of foreign domination known as capitalism. African intellectuals must unite with the people and plan the struggle to defeat imperialism in Africa. In his essential text, The Groundings with My Brothers, one of the greatest African working class intellectuals, the African patriot and martyr Walter Rodney, referred to this process as grounding, learning from and listening to the people and their communal wisdom, learning the local history and cultural dynamics, and reasoning together. Amakar Cabral referred to this as class suicide. African students have begun to heed Louise Kinshasa's call. From the aforementioned conferences and direct actions in the U.S. to the Fees Must Fall campaign in Occupy Zanya. Yet, in a 2016 essay penned by Director Tafari McGarry in Occupy Zanya, in response to the Fees Must Fall campaign, Tafari urges organizers to extend action by embracing the advanced political theory of African internationalism and, quote, to turn these institutions into bases for revolutionary organization that will not be limited to student life, but will take form outside academic life too, unquote. In the first part of today's episode, we hear directly from Louise Kinshasa. Louise is the Secretary General of the African Socialist International. Under the leadership of Chairman Amali Chatella, Louise oversees the work of the African People's Socialist Party around the world including, but not limited to Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean. S.G. Louise was born in the Congo and is currently based in London. He is affectionately known as Mwalimu, which means teacher, for his extensive knowledge and engaged storytelling about the history of the world's peoples. In part two, we talk with Soliana Bikel. Soliana is the managing editor and writer for the Burning Spear newspaper. Soliana is also a student at Hampton University one of the oldest black colleges in the US. Soliana majors in political science and journalism. She was born in Ethiopia and was raised in the Washington DC area. In this first segment, we will hear a presentation from S.G. Lawazi given to the All African People's Development and Empowering Projects Ask the Doctor series. In this talk, 
Louise outlines the colonial contradictions for African students and makes an appeal for them to join the African Revolution. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, we are not free yet. And uh, that's the way I would like to start, particularly uh, for students, uh, African students, uh, young people, tendencies to think uh, I do what I want to do. I do as, uh, you know, as I like. No, Africans are not free. This has to inform everything we do. African continent is not free. Black people, anywhere we live on a planet, we are not free. This has to be really clear. Otherwise, we get confused. We will be acting as the oppressors. No, we are not free at all. It's a myth to think that Africa is a free continent. And uh, African students need to know one thing. You can't be a student in general. You know, like uh, white students, like Japanese students, or Chinese students, or French students. You just can't be a student in general. You have to be a student of uh, struggle to free black people. You have to be a black power student. You have to be an African internationalist student. As I said in the beginning, freedom has to be the starting point of everything we do. Doesn't matter what you study. It doesn't matter uh, um, where you're coming from, where you're born, how you look like, as long as you're black, as long as you're an African, the starting point has to be freedom of black people. And uh, we also have to just make sure that when I say you can't be a student just in general, because the white students are not students in general. So are uh, the Japanese or the, the Chinese or the Russians. They are not students in general. They have mandates to implement, to pursue. Uh, if you're a Chinese student, you know very well. If you're studying uh, science, they want you to do well to understand how to carry out cyber war. How to do space war. They want you to do that. They want you to understand nanotechnology. So you're not just a Chinese student in general. You have a mandate from the Chinese government, uh, from the Chinese society. And we African people do not have legitimate government anywhere. So we don't have a really legitimate mandate to carry for us to be free because our organizations that used to organize uh, uh, black people freedom, they have been destroyed a while ago. Uh, you know, the, you know about Malcolm X, you know about the Mumba, you know, Fred Hampton and Son killed, movement destroyed. So we, when I say we, me, uh, Dr. Isha, Dr. Masmila and the others, we are part of a movement. We are part of a party uh, that is carrying out the legitimate mandate of African nation. And we want African students to embrace, to join us in carrying out the mandate because we represent the best interests of the African nation. We represent the material interest of the African nation. And uh, it's really uh, fundamental uh, for us. We know how important it is for students to know their past, to know their history. You know, you have to know your history, that's true. You have to know that the calendar we're using today is our calendar. We made the calendar. The calendar we're using today, it wasn't used some 4,236 years before Christ. You need to know those things. You need to know that all, you know, things like uh, the Greek civilization is a myth. For a simple reason, the Greek didn't even have a writing system. Their own alphabet is our alphabet, is ours. You know, uh, the paper, we invented the paper. You need to know those things. And so on. But what is really important is you have to be part of a movement to recapture our freedom, which means our future, so that everyone can be proud, can be happy to see life in a black skin. So nobody's depressed or you know powerless or demoralized and things like that. So you have to be part of that movement. Not just to know your past, to know our past, but to recapture our future. Because if you don't have a future, it's not good enough just to know we were great in the past. It's not good enough. So you, you have to be a, a, a dynamic, a living part of a new movement we are building to recapture our future. That's really fundamental. And when I say you can't be a student just in general, you know, when I was uh, at university, uh, there was 
you know, we were told all the time, we are not into the political parties and things like that. You have to be a political. That's not true. It's a lie. You look around you where you are in the United States or where I am in England. Who rules these places? Here they will tell you some 60 or 70 percent of all the key positions in society from the governments, in armed forces, the police, you name it. They come from the leading universities, Oxford University, Cambridge University, Imperial College University. And you're going to tell me those two universities are neutral, apolitical. They are not. They're not apolitical. They train you to be leaders in colonial society. That's what I train them. So they are not apolitical. So African citizens cannot be apolitical. To be apolitical, it just means you agree with the status quo. You are satisfied. You are happy. To see African nation, Af African people, black people being oppressed, being humiliated every day. So you can't be for that. So you have to be a well organized. You have to know what's going on. You have to know what the African People's Socialist Party is doing. You have to know what ABDEP, the organization who is organizing this event, is doing. So you can be a living part of the struggle to change this world. That's what it means to be a student, to be intellectual, to be young, is to be involved in a movement to change the world. And you have to play a role uh, in that. And uh, that's, this is just uh, uh, some of the things uh, we have to be really clear about. And uh, when we say universities are not neutral places, you have to know most of the funds, uh, the funding of those universities are colonial funds. Universities, they get the money from corporations or from even from the state. But the state and the corporations, they get the money from colonial domination of African and other colonized people in the world. So when you are in those universities, you have to be conscious that you are in environments that depend on sucking the blood of black people for those universities to receive the funds. Because remember, universities don't create a value in society. They are places of learning. And all these professors, they are well paid. All these laboratories are well funded. Where the money comes from? That's the daily exploitation of the colonies. And you can remember, African continent is a colony. It's a colonized country. And black people, wherever we are, we are colonized people. That's why we are always poor. Because when you're colonized, you can all be... Uh, you cannot have a decent life. You're always poor as a community, as a collective. You know, few of us, uh, you know, uh, can have uh, some good jobs, good pay, but generally speaking, the majority, of an overwhelming majority of our people will always be poor. And the reason they're being poor is because they will never pay them well enough so they can have a decent uh, living. So these all, all these monies, they go to fund the university. So you are dealing with uh, a representative or the blood sucking system. You are not just an university because, you know, you are intelligent, which is true. You are smart, it's true. All that things, all those things are true. But university is a creation. It's a creation of development in society, in society that has been uh, 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 given so much resources that they have to find new ways to explore, to develop, to transform those resources so they can make modern products. And you have to know, when you look at society as uh, we're living today, where do you get most of the gold? Where do you get most of the platinum? Where do you get, where do you get most of the uh, diamond, most of the, of the coltan, most of the uranium? All those things you get them in Africa and throughout uh, the colonized countries, but you get most of them from Africa, things like platinum, coltan, cobalt, you can't make. You can all make green uh, green uh, cars, as they call it, uh, clean cars, green car, based on electricity without cobalt. And most of cobalt, over 60%, is in Africa, in the Congo. Most of platinum you need is in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and, and South Africa. And uh, basically, you just, you, just, you just can't go around. Uh, in this uh, um, a system without Africa. You have to be aware of it. Africa is the cornerstone of the world economy. Don't believe all this nonsense you see on the television, these bad films so showing the, you know, the, uh, the bad situation. It's true, the situation is bad. But in reality, 
if you say the imperialism, get out of Africa, they will fight you. And they will fight you to death. That's why France, United States, they're all digging in Africa, building more military bases, making it difficult uh, for us to access our own resources. That's how significant Africa is. That's how significant your work is going to be. That's how significant your struggle, our struggle is going to be, because the world has to be free. But for the world has to be free, colonial capitalism has to be defeated in its most strategic part, which is on the African continent. And black people around the world, and particularly black students, have to play a key role in this struggle uh, to build a new fu future, a new uh, uh, world. And uh, so there are other things uh, I would like to, uh, to mention uh, is that uh, Africa needs, uh, when I say Africa, I mean the African nation, black people everywhere. We need uh, a new cultural revolutionary uh, movement and uh, you have to be part of that movement. African students joining up, African students uh, managing all kinds of projects, bringing their skills to the community, uh, bringing science to the community, to the African community everywhere. We have lively debates, discussions, understanding science, discussing, you know, COVID-19, you know, what's the, what's the truth uh, about that? Discussing all other issues that the people need to, to know so that our scientific and also technological, but scientific level uh, uh, is developed. Because at the moment, everything obscure, everything to put the veil on the brain and the eyes of the people is most of them are unchallenged. You have all kinds of opportunities, all kinds of preachers, anything goes in the black community. So, except science. So we need to bring science in our community. And the African student, since you are the ones who are in the university grappling with all these new concepts, all these sophisticated concepts, the people need to know about it because when you understand it and you come back to the community, you break them down. You know, you make it understandable, digestible by the people so they begin to, to understand our rights. So we need uh, to be able to grow our own food if we apply this kind of principle. Yes, that's how you do it. Uh, we can fix uh, all our own cars ourselves. If we have training on how to fix a car, all these students studying mechanics, they can give training. Uh, the same with computers. Everyone uses computers. Everyone uses electronic stuff. When it comes to fixing it, you don't see enough technicians in the right community, but there's so many people in the community talented. If given some explanation, some training, they will get it. So we will get this knowledge, the expertise you have in universities, bring them back. We talk about reparation. So you have to be in university, where's the struggle, with the white student, with the Chinese student, all of them, explain to them, win them to be in solidarity with African revolution. You go win them. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I'm university. Uh, they love uh, hip hop. Me too. You know, my brother is a rapper. So you, you know, you have work, a good time. That's not enough. Being young means having a good time. But being young, it means preparing for the future. So you cannot, you cannot allow everybody just to enjoy black culture without anything in return. And anything in return means they have to be in solidarity with our own agenda, our own programs. That's uh, some of the, uh, uh, the things that we need to take to university. We have to define the debate. What is the debate in university? What's the debate is going to be about university? This is the job of a young students, uh, African student. They have to define what the debate should be. We, we will bring all the issues. Uh, we have massive imprisonment. Of Africans uh, in the United States, uh, the chloridon. Chlorid the chloridon is this product the French has used in the Martinique and Guadeloupe to pollute the river. Chlordecol. You go bring those things there. The genocide in the Congo. You go bring that university. The the looting of Africa. You go bring that university. So you determine. You set the terms. What's, what is the debate in a university, as opposed to going to university and finding out what everybody else is doing and you joining in or allow the Democratic Party to come and define the debate and locking you up in a discussion, you know, is racism bad in the US uh, or, you know, racism bad in France? How can we do, you know, you know, 
how can we defeat racism? Uh, you know, uh, things like that. We don't want to be wasting our time on discussions like racism. Everything has to do, to do about power. You want to be students dealing with power. We have things like the dates. How can African students be in debt? When our label build universities, when universities are funded with the money stolen from uh, black people uh, around the world, how can we be in debt? Most of the gold come from us. Most of the diamond come from us. You know, you name it. Uh, all most of those resources come from us. How can you be in debt? We already paid for our studies thousand times. So all of these are part of the struggle. So to be student. To be African student is to be involved in struggle because there is not a way you can shape the future. There is not a way you can capture the future if you're not part uh, of the struggle. And uh, you have to privilege collective success. When you're smart, as uh, the African student, they will work on you. You are so different. You are so smart. We have some, you know, Career layout out uh, for you. They want to make you uh, take you to Wall Street, take you to laboratories to make submarines or aircraft, things like that. That isolates you from your people, from the community, from the struggles. That's no success. If it's a success, that's imperialist success. Because all your skills, all your knowledge, everything you have developed, you have learned, created, will be used against African nation and against vast majority of uh, colonized people in the world. You don't want to do that. You don't want your creativity. You don't want your skills, your knowledge to be used against the people. You want your knowledge to be part of the struggle uh, to raise uh, the uh, you know political, organizational uh, levels uh, of the people. So when you're in university, there's nothing wrong to be known as a fighter for African people. There's nothing wrong with it. Because you have to be aware that the United States government, the United States colonial society is in permanent crisis, in a state of permanent crisis. The French colonial society, the French ruling class, the English ruling class, the English colonial society, they are all in a state of permanent crisis. African students have to be informed by that too. So our job is to take the opportunity there in crisis so we can deepen that crisis, which means while you're organizing, you're working collectively with your friends uh, to be smart in school, to pass your exam and so on, but you are working to bring everybody together to serve the needs, to serve the mandate of the revolution of Black people. Also, Part of what you need to realize, and uh, that's really critical, because being a student, it means no being opposed to the African working class. It doesn't mean that. Being a student, that's not mean you're enemy of the African working class. Being a student, that's not mean that you are above the African working class. That's how we were educated. We were told, be somebody. And be somebody, it means what? Having jobs like white people, being in the government, and things like that. What does that mean, being an African student? For example, if in the most African countries, over 60%, over 60% of the budget is consumed by cadres of the neo-colonial society, which means students who graduate, they become cadres to solve the problems, not for black people to be free, but to solve the problems for colonizers and their accomplices of the African people who rise to maintain the black people in colonization permanently. And that's how you get paid, because you are a cadre uh, to maintain black people in in domination. That's no a good job. That's no a good career. That's no a good feeling. You go home every day, you look at your children, and the only job you do is to maintain the status quo. And that's what to be cadre under neocolonialism is. It doesn't matter if you, if you see you're honest or not, because neocolonialism is a system of domination of black people for the benefit of white nation, which is a colonial state. It was born like that. And it can only maintain itself as a colonial state, still, still stealing the resources of black people and other colonized people uh, around the world. So what I'm trying to say, you have to go back to the roots, to the foundation, to the source of power, 
where the wealth that mesmerizes everybody comes from. The wealth you see around you is generated by the working class, by the African working class and other colonized working class people. But the African working class, as I said, is the cornerstone of that. You have to go to them, go back to them, live with them. They need you and you also need them for you to be a student, to talk tall, to stand tall, to have dignity. You must be part of a free nation. Just like the Chinese student, the Indian student, they talk tall because they know whatever they do is to benefit their nation. They are clear on that. But we, whatever we do, is to serve corporations, parasitic corporations, which are all tied to black life. They are opposed to any dignity, any dignified black life. So you have to go back to the African working class. That's where everything happens. That's where everything we want to do. To succeed, it has to start from the people, from the African working class. And when we say from the African working class, you understand that we live in a modern world. And if we organize ourselves very well, we have everything we need to build a modern Africa, a modern African nation, where the needs of all black people on the planet will be fulfilled and satisfied. Africa has everything you need. When I say everything, Africa has everything. I will just take out uh, uh, some examples just very uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, taking this from Black Africa, this is a book by uh, uh, The Economic and Cultural Basis for a Federated State. And uh, you can't industrialize Africa without energy. You can't have a modern economy without energy. And Africa has all the potential energies you need in the world. Hydraulic energy, Africa has it in abundance. Just all the rivers you have in Africa is enough to produce electricity to electrify the whole of Africa. If we talk about the solar energy, just to give you an example, each square kilometer on which the sun shines each day gets a quantity of energy equivalent to that of an, an ordinary atomic bomb. I uh, hope you all heard what I, I just read. Each square kilometer on which the sun shines each day gets a quantity of energy equivalent to that of an ordinary atomic bomb. You know the sun shines all over Africa every day? In Africa, it's bigger than the United States and Canada and China combined. Can you see the level of energy the African students, African uh, engineers have to master so we can produce electricity? Everything is there. So that's, that's just the solar energy. You take the uh, atomic energy uh, coming from uh, uranium. Uh, France gets 75% of its electricity from uranium. And over 50% of uranium used in France comes from Niger in Africa. That's why there's war in Mali. Mali also has a uranium, and France want to keep that uranium for itself. That's your uranium. That's our uranium. So we can produce electricity for ourselves. So we have the atomic energy, at least the foundation of it. So you have uh, the uh, wind energy, the thermal energy of the seas. Think of Africa as a massive island, the sea all around us. So we can produce electricity from uh, the thermal energy of the sea. We've got the tidal energy. We've got the global heat energy. We have the volcanic thermal energy. We have the geothermal energy. And I don't even talk about the oil and the gas, things like that, how they can be transformed, how the coal, uh, how the coal can be conf- uh, transformed to produce energy. But everywhere in Africa, we suffer from lack of energy. It's unbelievable. From South Africa to Nigeria, there are problems every single day. And we have to buy generators from English or Chinese. So basically, they loot us with our oil all our minerals, and they sell to us generators that we don't really need because we have all the natural potential to electrify uh, Africa. So these are just uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, energy and in terms of uh, industrialization, uh, I'll just give one example and I'll stop here. Think of the forest from uh, Senegal, Casamance, to uh, South Africa, particularly 
and up to Angola, where you have the uh, equatorial uh, forest, Central Africa, probably Cameroon, the Congo, the Congo Basin. All the plants we need to make modern medicine is there. Everything you need is there. Everything we need is there. But the African ruling class, they spend every year $6 billion to get treatment abroad in uh, Singapore, in England, United States. So in 10 years, that's $60 billion spent. That's our money. That's money to fund research you can do. That's money to build pharmacies. That's money. I can't really, you know, there are so many things we can say. Africa has a future, a brilliant future. But we have to free Africa. We have to organize. We have to unite all African students, put all our brains together from Canada to South uh, of America, uh, from the Caribbean to Europe, from North Africa to South Africa, throughout the island in the Pacific. We have to organize black people. We have to win our students to be the vanguard student, the students who are leading, the, they, are, they are taking the fight universities to take the best of African students back to revolutionary struggle where they belong, so they can unite with the African working class and launch the offensive the offensive that will bring freedom and black power to all black people on the planet and end once for all this parasitic capitalist colonialist system that does not deserve to live to exist even for one second. And this is in your hand. And we want that to be in your brain. And we want you to be an active organizer for black freedom. We, a vanguard student, is a student that fight for black power and unification of, of the black nation. Uh, that's fighting to capture, capture our future. Be that student. Be that student. Be the vanguard student. That was Secretary General Louise Kinshasa's presentation on the All African People's Development and Empowerment Projects Ask the Doctor series. You can view the full video of that episode on the All African People's Development and Empowerment Projects YouTube page. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we are discussing the role of the African intellectual in the world. Next up, we have Soliana Bekev, managing editor of the Burning Spear newspaper. Uhuru Soliana, what's going on, comrade? Uhuru, thank you so much for having me. All right on, have you on. So Soliana, you answered the call of S.G. Louise. First, you began as a volunteer, then you joined the African People's Socialist Party, and now you're the managing editor of the oldest Black Power newspaper in print, The Burning Spear. Why was this important for your political trajectory? Um, in terms of my political trajectory, being managing editor or just even a part of the production team for The Burning Spear um, was monumental to my trajectory. I can't speak to its total impact on my trajectory because it's a trajectory, so it's still moving. And I'm still, you know, growing politically every day. But I think being managing editor and being in constant constant contact with people like Director Akile, my direct leadership, um, as well as President Yejide, and really anyone in the party puts me in the situations I need to be to grow politically within the party's line. Um, so on top of being managing editor, being in the party alone, has really been critical to my political growth. So, so, so how'd you come to the political position of being an African internationalist? Yeah, so I guess it really started when I was um, in high school. I had, um, and I was a senior in high school and I had this uh, class that I took called um, Global Majority Studies um, taught by my favorite teacher, Mr. Shabazz. And he really exposed um, um, you know, students to a lot of the history that we weren't exposed to. I mean, I took AP United States history and I was, you know, nearly exposed to the things that he exposed us to. So like he taught us about um, the Panthers. Um, he taught us about Kwame Ture, um, SNCC and all the things that, um, like I said, wasn't exposed to. And he really challenged um, what we were taught. And it was funny because I had him like for the last, I had him, he was my last um, class during the day. And so I would have my, you know, traditional U U.S. history classes. And then he'd be like, okay, so what'd you learn today? And he'd be like, okay, so let me tell you how that's wrong and um, really break it down for us. And it wouldn't really hit with a lot of people. People would just kind of take it because it had this representation of being an easy class, but he really did challenge everything that, um, that I was taught. And so 
that really wakened that within me. And then he pushed me to go to an HBCU because he believed that I would have a better shot at just being exposed to, I guess, non-traditional things. Um, and so that's how I would say, like, I started my political journey. Oh, so speaking of you being at an HBCU and a historically black college, what year are you in school right now? Right now I'm a junior, so it's my third year. Oh, wow. So it's your third year. So you've spent most of your college career uh, in some form of distance education or, you know, COVID training right right now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's an interesting experience. Now, you attend Hampton, one of the oldest historically Black colleges in the U.S. How is it being an African internationalist on campus? Um, Isolating, for sure. Um, Not to say that there aren't politically active folks on campus. Um, There for sure are. But most of the time, uh, the political analysis of, you know, their experience as Africans in the U.S. usually ends with this um, liberal line, you know, this idea that they're redemption or liberation through the law or sometimes it's just like straight contradictions like some will agree that there is no redeeming this country for black people but turn around and vote for joe biden and get mad at me because you know my my politics are consistent so despite being around you know some black folks you, you gotta you know contend with that neo-colonial petty bourgeois contradiction that you know we can be saved because we have a black vice president or something so right right and i know that there are a variety of different a student organizations, you know, some people go to HBCU to join fraternities and sororities or or to be tapped into these networks of African petty bourgeois middle class people that date back decades, if even centuries, so that they can embedder their lives. Uh, but, um, you know, you've taken a different position politically. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm not in a sorority or anything like that. Um, definitely not my uh, circle of people. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to organize a horror movement step team? <laughs> you know, I would. I think it would let me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Well, you know, we're going to have to teach you that South African uh, boot dance. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, oh. So, so, Liana, so you're a political science and journalism major. What made you choose that major? Um, so when I was a senior in high school, I had um, some trouble deciding what to major in because I really liked history and literature. And majoring in one of those seemed like a one way ticket to becoming a high school teacher. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just not something I wanted to do, per se. Um, and like I said earlier, I took this class called um, Global Majorities. Um, that was really, you know, an outlier. Um, you know, that was the first class I learned about the Panthers, Kwame Ture, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and all them people. And so I thought, you know, learning about the local um, and global politics, you know, within the broad field of political science would help me, you know, understand history better um, and the world better. And so I thought it was a good mix. Um, and so based on my experiences in high school, kind of feeling like I wasn't exposed to the things that I should have been, I just trusted myself to learn about the things that I um, knew I probably wouldn't learn in college either. And so, um, yeah, and so I thought political science would be a safer route in terms of just being always disappointed in my schooling system. And so, um, and I mean, I was kind of proven right. Uh, my freshman year of college, I took um, one African-American history class and uh, we went directly from the civil rights movement to intersectionality, which, you know, makes no chronological sense, but that's you know literally what happened. And so I thought that, um, yeah, I guess doing political science would, um, would help me better, I guess, yeah. So, you know, is this a major that, like, originally drew you to volunteer the Burning Spear? Like, how'd you find the Burning Spear newspaper? Um, so, yeah, I do actually uh, minor in journalism as well, but it's it's actually kind of the opposite. Um, I didn't add journalism as a minor until last semester, um, so that was kind of recent, but um, that came from my love of writing, but definitely my experiences in the Burning Spear as well. Um, I was with the newspaper before, I became a journalism minor um, and I saw like potential for, you know, a practical application of whatever useful thing I might learn. Right. And, um, right. Yeah. That's it's actually, you know, my experiences in the newspaper that wanted me to do journalism in school. So, you know, in recent years, um, you know, we've seen a huge rise as far as student activism. So like what actions have you been involved in? Unfortunately, there hasn't been, 
anything on campus, um, you know, speaking to Hampton University um, that I could be involved in because Hampton doesn't really um, encourage that. They're very hush hush or almost totalitarian in terms of um, the rules that they have for students. Um, we can't like, like organize and um, like, let's say if we have something against the university or even any like political issue that we want to address as students, um, if we congregate and, you know, do like a rally or, you know, a silent protest, even that's like breaking some kind of, um, you know, guideline. Um, and so trying to organize that, let alone actually doing it is like super difficult because they'll just kick you out. That's happened before. So Hampton just doesn't embrace that. Mm, so you have been involved in, uh, in actions off of campus, though. I know you recently attended the uh, the BIBC March, the Black is Back Coalition March. How was that experience? That experience was definitely um, a first for me in terms of just being out there. And since I, you know, was with the newspaper at that point, I, you know, had to, you know, talk to people and do field reporting. And so that really um, was an amazing experience for me because I really got to kind of do the practical part of uh being in the newspaper as well, like actually doing something and then reporting it, um, you know, for everybody who probably wasn't there or was there. Um, so yeah, that um, that experience was definitely also meaningful to me because that was the first time I got to see a lot of people in the party that I've met through Zoom. That was the first time I saw Director mm-hmm. Keelan. Um, that was the first time I saw Matsumela. So that was a lot. Of, that was really meaningful to me. Um, yeah, that was probably one of the best days. <laughs> uhuru, uhuru, Solana. Now you were born in Ethiopia, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, if I'm correct, your first article in The Burning Spirit was on the neo-colonial crisis in Ethiopia. Yeah. In his article, The Role of the African Intellectual in the World, S.G. Louise demands that African students become African working class intellectuals and solve the problems African people face. Understanding this, why was this an important article for you to write? Um, understanding this, you know, role of African intellectuals, right, the role of um, using your intellect to work to, you know, better the conditions of Africans um, was absolutely, was really crucial to me because if I didn't understand that, I would, you know, be going to school just for myself at that point. Um, and as much as job security is great, um, I don't want to be that African that just, you know, climbs that corporate capitalist tower and eventually um, becomes a part of the petty bourgeois class. And so, that article was important for me to write because it needed to be understood, um, especially with Ethiopia, that colonialism, you know, the drawing of arbitrary borders, the somehow silly idea that Africans over here are different from the ones over there, um, was the central con- contradiction, you know, that caused all the problems that we witnessed, especially because um, it's a problem that's instigated by, you know, the historic problems um, by, you know, certain, you know, quote, ethnic groups. Um, you know, the problems that were, you know, constructed, right, um, from, you know, European col- colonialism. So I think, um, if I remember correctly, the article ends, you know, with this idea that there is no, quote, Ethiopian solution, right? Um, Ethiopia was constructed the same way other African countries are constructed and arbitrarily named. So I think understanding this is crucial um, to be able to analyze the situation correctly and not buy into this dangerous idea that, you know, somehow things will be better because a new politician was elected, you know, especially with um, Abi. So, yeah, it was definitely crucial. Oh, oh, thank you for that, comrade. So, Soliana, you're a student and uh, you're also a revolutionary. Why would you say that it's important for African students to commit themselves to the African liberation movement? Uh, what are some things you think they can be doing on campus and in the community to achieve this objective? Um, Definitely. I think um, aspects of class suicide, for sure, because, you know, joining the intellectual class is, you know, really a path to... The, um, you know, becoming part of the petty bourgeoisie of left and checks, especially. But, um, you know, this question really makes me think of what um, Kwame Nkrumah said, um, you know, revolutionary and first president of Ghana. Um, I think he answered this question really well in his book, um, uh, Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. Um, so I'm just going to quote him real quick. So he says, the youth belong to the revolution. Our universities, colleges and schools and enemy held in contested zones can become centers of revolutionary protest. Students should establish close links with the workers and provide the spark needed to set in motion demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, and armed insurrection. Effective student worker cooperation can paralyze a reactionary power structure and compel change. In liberated areas, students must constantly guard and revitalize the revolution. 
on our youth depends the future of Africa and the continent's total liberation and unity. And I couldn't have said it better myself because, you know, as a student who, you know, thinks this way, you you can't find peace with, you know, your current situation, the current situation of every African. Um, and so I think if we're able to, at least as students, beyond just, you know, learning the ways of the world, I think it's important to, you know, try to make, like you said, um, you know, these enemy held contested zones as, you know, centers of revolutionary protest in any way that we can. And so I think that's the way that um, students can commit to the African liberation movement. Or, Ooh, thank you. Thank you. So I really want to appreciate you being on the show today with us, comrade. I think this is, if I recall correctly, I think this is your first appearance on Black Power Talk. So, you know, we want to ask you, do you have any parting words for us? Anything for our listeners? Yeah, sure. I just really want to thank you all for having me. It was such an honor. You know, I don't really love talking about myself all that much, but I do appreciate (laughs) the space. So (laughs) thank you. Right on. Appreciate you, comrade. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we discuss the role of the African intellectual in the world. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Likia and Goma. Thanks to the Black Power Talk Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and Ahib Sapanda. Uhuru. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not going to get in the mess.
nothing. God has not going to put it in your lap. 